Hey, what's good, y'all? It's your boy JD6 here with my man. Shout out to KC Sports Authority. Make sure y'all go check that podcast out, man. You heard the man. And welcome into the KC Sports Authority podcast. I am your host, Keegan Russell. You can find our podcast over on Spotify and on YouTube. And if you're watching right here on YouTube, go ahead and do us a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button. We are on our way to 500 subscribers here on YouTube. And we're getting very close. So shout out to all of our listeners and subscribers that we've had so far. You guys have been fantastic. We've picked up about 60 subscribers in the last week and now are over 350. So thank you guys so much for the support you've been giving us. Hope we can continue to earn that support from me and if you're new to the show welcome hopefully you guys enjoyed all the content we've been doing whether it's KU Chiefs Royals NBA NFL whatever it is we cover we hope you guys enjoy what we talk about so if you can hit that subscribe button real quick here if you're listening on Spotify go ahead and follow and like the podcast on there as well you can also check all of our other content out over on Instagram TikTok Facebook and Twitter at KCSA pod all right, well, in today's episode, you know, it might be early February, but baseball season is on the horizon. And I had the pleasure and the opportunity to sit down and uh, speak with the head baseball coach of the University of Kansas Jayhawks, Dan Fitzgerald. Coach Fitz is entering the second season with this program. You know, for those of you that paid attention last year, they had a pretty solid season in his first year here. And they are looking forward to year two under his regime getting started here with their first games coming up here February 16th down in Texas. And then their first homestand up here in Lawrence the weekend of March 1st. So I had a great time sitting down with him, talking all things baseball from the season last year to the team we have this upcoming year. Went through expectations, predictions, some of the players to look out for and all that. So I hope you guys enjoy the conversation that I had with him. He's a fantastic guy. You can already tell that he bleeds crimson and blue. Fantastic hire again by Travis Goff and company in this athletic program. Um, KU Athletics is a lot of fun. And this is this is another guy that screams excellent leadership, a guy that's very bought into the development of this program. Program. So I hope you guys really enjoy it. So without further ado, here is my conversation with head baseball coach of the Kansas Jayhawks, Dan Fitzgerald. All right, Jayhawk fans, I am now joined by the head coach of your Kansas Jayhawks baseball team, Dan Fitzgerald. Coach, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm good, Keegan. How are you doing, man? Thanks for oh, having me. Fantastic. So we're getting ready to start baseball season. The weather's been starting to warm up a bit. I know it's early February, but man, you guys have first pitch in like two weeks. How's, uh, how's everybody feeling over there with baseball season on the horizon? We're good. We're, we're healthy. We are outside. We are ready to go. You know, this is a, a long buildup when you think about, you know, you go through an entire summer recruiting, you jump into the fall, it's an extensive fall practice, and then you've got a long winter of, of some really important time, though, for pitchers to get ready and position players to heal up and make some gains in the weight room, and then you come back and in January and start at it and it's all kind of with the that mid-February date in mind so we're approaching on it we're ready for it and you can't wait to get going. I'm sure it also feels pretty good to have a full off season this time around going into year two to really dive into everything with the you know somewhat I'm, I'm sure in your world that's a late start middle of summer have to really jump on recruiting quick and of course you guys did pretty solid there first year but before we get into the team just want to real quick, just see how you and the family are doing with the, the move to Lawrence, how, how you guys have been enjoying your time here, maybe any adjustments that's been difficult or easy. What's the process been like for you guys? It, you know, it's been great. We, my wife and I have three boys and, and they, you know, have jumped head first into being Jayhawks. And I think we, we've come to Lawrence at such a special time of football being really good, basketball, of course, being basketball. And then really all of our other sports are just – thriving so we're in a great great time to be a jayhawk and you know lawrence has been phenomenal our, our middle son has autism and lawrence special ed is incredible you know what one thing that people don't talk about enough is that ku has the number one undergrad special ed degree in the country and i think the trickle down into the community is is really special and and so you know for max to be uh in such an awesome, thriving academic environment with people who are really talented and, and, and really just amazing people has been great. And then Will and Ben are trying to become, uh, you know, two sport Jayhawks playing basketball and, and baseball. And, uh, you know, they come from a great basketball pedigree. I played when I was five and then finished up when I was six. So, you know, I'm sure they've got <laughs> a, a great basketball future ahead. No, but we're having fun, man. It's been, it's been great. 
Uh, I'm from weird. Minneapolis. Kelly's from Chicago, so we're a little bit closer to to our roots. Yeah. Any? Do you guys have any favorite spots around town? You guys like to enjoy going to? No, oh, man, there are a ton of them. You know, we've I, I, my boys would say Silas and Maddie's before. Uh, you know, before all else, that's their that's their number one spot, and we have certainly spent plenty of time there. So that that's kind of one of those unique, awesome. Uh, our, our first our first day here for the press conference, it was about eight thousand degrees, and that night we went to and Maddie's, and it's, it's been a staple ever since. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 a Lawrence classic. Well, let's talk some baseball, of course. Want to start first with just go back to last year, you know, first year with the program, first year here in Lawrence. You, you've said in many press conferences before that you, you've driven all around Kansas. You've, you've been through Lawrence before, but now you're, you're here. You're establishing some roots to, to build a long term program. First year, you know, I'm sure coaches always have high expectations, no matter the change of scenery. Um, so you guys probably came in with your own expectations. But I think from the fan base, it's always we want to see the new program, see the new guys come in, establish the new culture, kind of lay out the vision of the program and then just kind of see some development throughout the year. So you guys go 25 and 32 to finish off the first year, which I don't know where that sat really for you guys expectation wise. But I think from the fan base, you know, we're not used to having the traditional high powered baseball team out here in Lawrence, like some other programs that either you've been to in the past or around the country. So just kind of take me through last year. Obviously you had a, a, a bright spot with, with a young freshman in Cody. He, he had a fantastic year. One of the, one of the best freshmen, not just in the big 12, but across the country, but just kind of take me through year one. What were some of the takeaways, you know, the lessons you guys learned, some of the, the building blocks that this foundation we're building to see this program develop. Sure. Yeah, I think I think we hit the ground running last summer and, and crushed recruiting and put together a team. You know, we committed 22 guys two summers ago. 18 ended up on or, uh, 19 ended up on campus. We had one get drafted and then two academic casualties. So we ended up with 19 new guys last year and really grinded our way through it. And, and really, you know, I've, I've been so blessed to be on incredible teams and play in the NCAA tournament, uh, you know, a lot. And I've, I've been proud of every team that I've coached. I'm as proud of last year's team as any of them. And if you would have told me 25 and 32, that that'd be something that I'd be proud of, you know, I probably would have questioned that, but it was, it was the fact that we really got more out of what we had in, in many, many ways. We were, we were so thin, our depth was uh, really non-existent. And so we, we came in, put the team together and then just tried to grind through that fall. And it was a really hard fall. And and kind of, I, when I say hard, I think anything worthwhile, Keegan, as you know, is, is hard. Very few things that are awesome come easy. So yeah. grinded through it and, and really felt like we established who we were in a really clear picture of like, this is what a Jayhawk looks like. And this is what Jayhawk baseball looks like. And and then, and then went through the season and, and played our butts off. You know, we had some dark moments and we had some awesome moments. You know, we, we, to get back to the big 12 tournament to double our, our big 12 win total, you know, at, at one point, you know, we get swept, we get swept to TCU. So I, I guess I'll back up and say, you know, the first couple of weeks, we're, we're finding our stride, trying to figure it out. We open up conference. We just get hammered at TCU. But if you back up a week before we had been down in South Carolina and we didn't, we didn't win like we wanted to, but we started to play better and we really started to play baseball the right way. We were moving runners. We were taking really different approach at the plate. I could see that we were about to take a jump offensively. So we come back, we get, we get swept at TCU and we were kind of at a crossroads of, Hey guys, we can, we can turn this into a, a, a really long negative season if we want if we get caught up in the result, or we can really buy into what we've said since last August. And that's, we're going to be process centered, process driven and play the game. Really, you know, it's the old cliche, but if, if you try to play this game anyway, other than one pitch at a time, it's, it's just yeah. unplayable. So we get Baylor at home. We sweep them. We go on the road to West Virginia. We take two or three, and now we're right back in the mix in the big 12. And so I think we showed, awesome glimpses throughout the year. And one of the highlights for me was, you know, we went five and three on Friday nights in the big 12 and Colin Baumgartner was our Friday guy the entire year. And 
Baum has a chance to pitch in the big league season, the Colorado Rockies organization right now. But if you really look at his stuff, and I, I mean this as the greatest compliment to Baum, you know, it's not like he's Madison Baumgartner out there. You know, like it's it he's not related to Madison. Like he is, it's it it's not you know, 100 miles an hour and a wipeout slider it is very, very awesome strategic mix of I come at you with strikes, I I locate in and out, and I just compete. Like we have guys on our team last year that had better stuff than Bomb, but he just showed, hey, I can, I can compete at a really high level. And we kick a ball against TCU on Friday night, and we kind of gave it away to Kansas State. Otherwise, we're, you know, we're seven to one on Friday night. So I thought to me, that was a really, really big indicator of if we get it right on the mound, we're going to compete at a really high level. So, you know, got through the year and, you know, certainly some highlights, you know, knocking out Texas in the uh, Big 12 tournament. That was huge. Fun. Yeah, beat the beat the Big 12 pitcher of the year twice and, uh, you know, did a, did a lot of positive things. But the thing I'm most proud of, Keegan, I think is – that team had multiple options in moments throughout the year that the the culture thing could could have shifted. Mm-hmm. Guys could have been discouraged or said, "Hey, you know this is brutal," or "That was a tough loss." We fought till the end, and that that culture piece was so ingrained in the fabric of who we were to the very last pitch of the season. So proud of that. And then you know it's it's yeah. You hug the guys, you have a little exit meeting, and then literally you are recruiting five minutes later to try to do this yeah. thing all over. And I think we crushed it last year recruiting for this year. And so, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing up and down year one, but the important things got established. Yep. I think statistically, b- baseball is kind of a, a very finicky sport. I feel like it, it's one where no matter how much prep you do, how much you know film you watch, how much data you go through, Every pitch is so different and a guy could be riding the hottest hot streak we've ever seen. And then he gets a pitcher on the wrong night and that pitcher's just dialed in and then vice versa. You could have a pitcher who's been struggling and for whatever reason that day, everything clicks. So it, it's kind of like, you know, when they, in football, they always talk about any given Sunday, but I feel like in baseball, it's one of those, any given pitch could change the course of the entire game. And so I think it's not always a fair evaluation to just look at a team's overall record. Yes. Were there some negatives last year? There were several games. I'm sure you guys would, would love to just toss out that were, you know, very bad blowouts. But then there were also games where you guys bounced right back, um, put up a lot of big numbers and, and recovered. And I think one thing, you know, just looking at the statistics going through, year one with a new coach, there's really usually not a whole lot of, all right, we're going to do, we're really expecting to, to drive high success in this this category, you know, pitching at uh, batting average year, whatever the case may be. Uh, but offensively, you guys still had a pretty solid year. You, you matched one of the, the, uh, teams high in, in home runs in quite a while uh put up a lot of production that like i said we had a freshman that put up insane numbers as, as a freshman in college baseball that kansas hasn't really seen before so it's not always just the win and loss record you know like you said you guys had that stretch where you drop a few but then i think you rattled off like eight out of 11 to kind of get back into it no, i think that's no. that's key to some of that success is being able to fight back immediately and not let not let a three game slide turn into a seven eight game slide yeah bill said it last the, the other night after the game you know you can't let one turn into two and in baseball, you know, we, there's just, you got about 15 minutes to mourn a loss and then you got to move on and you got about 15 minutes to celebrate a win and then you got to move on. And it really is. It's just a, it's a battle of who can do it over the long haul, which is what makes baseball great. Also what makes baseball incredibly painful at times, because there are things that are so out of your control. You know, you think about it's the only game where the offense doesn't hold the ball. You know, once you once you put the ball in play, you have no control really over anything except being a base runner. And and but you know, th- there are a ton of things that you point to offensively last year that were great. You know, I, I told the guys before the year, I said, hey, listen, we got to be really really good with our approach because we're not going to break any home run records. And then you know, of course, we tied our school record. So <laughs> I told them I was right. We didn't break it. But you know, if the if you look at our offense from last year, the interesting thing, Keegan, is we lost the, the 2021, or I'm sorry, the 2022 Jayhawks. Uh, you know, there's multiple guys that before we got here jumped in the portal and went to other schools, and, and, and they had some really good offensive players, two third rounders, another guy that's in the SEC that's, you know, doing awesome, and another guy that went to a school out west that did really well, and another guy that went to a mid major and is now at a, at a power five. So, you know, there were the 2022 Jayhawks actually had a pretty 
pretty good offense. And that was really one of the question marks going into last year was, you know, you're losing all these offensive pieces from the year before and in the year before they really struggled on the mound. And so all those guys leave. And I think the question was, how are you going to replace some of these, these hitters? And I think, you know, my hitting guy, Tyler Hancock did an incredible job and, you know, we really like performed at a higher level than that team offensively. And I think it came down to our approach. The play it was fantastic. And you hit the nail on the head. Uh, Cody was, Cody was nails. And it's all those little things in, in year one that I think, you know, when you take the job and you talk at a press conference and, and you, you talk to people those first couple of weeks, you talk about it's a long runway and we're going to be patient and build this thing the right way. And it's true until you get in the game and you're like, well, we need to win right now. And so there's a little bit of that. You, you fight your patience, you fight your impatience. And, but overall, it would, I'd like to change some of the outcomes of some of the games, but I liked the process uh, 90% of the time. But put it this way, Keegan, if we have the same process this year, the same mindset, the same intent, the same compete, you know, that, that record looks very different. It's actually where I was going to go next is, is that process coming into year two with a full off season under your belt. You've had two really, really strong Juco classes coming in and hitting the high school recruiting as well. Um, actually what this is, I think two years back to back now of one of the top, top Juco classes in college baseball, which is impressive. And in this dynamic, the way of the transfer portal NIL, it's, you know, it's, I know every coach would love to just get strong high school talent and develop and develop and develop, but you still got to be able to get those guys that are performing other places and bring them into, give them a shot here. But as we're looking at the, the process coming into year two, you've had a couple, a huge upperclassmen leave depart. You've got a, a great core of returning guys. What, is there is there anything different about the process coming into this year as you guys prep for a first season? You know, expectations, you know, maybe on your end haven't changed, but expectations to the fan base might change now that we've seen a full year. But what is the process for you guys coming into into this second year? What might look different or what might look more the same? Well, hopefully the style of play in terms of the intensity, the the focus, the the others other, you know, I talk all the time to the guys about, you know, how do you play humble and confident at the same time? And, you know, there's a, there's a huge difference between arrogance and pride and humility and that selflessness. And so I think when you, when you can play for your team, certainly an individualized thing in so many ways, but when you're doing it for your team and willing to give up your at bat and not worried about your batting average, or, you know, not worried about, you know, playing first base instead of second or second base instead of short, that you really just want the good of the team and, and whatever that takes. I think uh, hopefully we look like that again, because I think we modeled a lot of that last year. What we didn't model at times last year was, you know, frankly, the depth and the ability to sustain a guy getting banged up and and then being able to bounce back from it. And that that's not the player's fault. That's just a, a that's just a depth thing. So I think when you look at last year, you've got Jackson Klein goes down, Collier Cranford goes down, and guys jumped in and competed. It just it, they weren't at the same level. So um, I think part of how the process looks different this year is we have legitimate competition at every spot. Like I, I know, you know we're all guilty of coach speak and and you know given the the pat answer. I legit don't know what our lineup is. I don't know what our rotation is. In fact, right after this, we've got a, a staff meeting where you know we kind of go through pitching roles and how we'd map out our, our first couple games. If if we're if we're up five in the third, if we're down five in the third, if we have to go to the pen early versus late, and and we've got options this year other than okay, when bomb comes out, we put Trumper in, and then Saturday, how do we get through it to get back to being able to put Trumper in the game? And so, I think the process is all right. My expectations haven't changed since, you know, I started this thing 20 some years ago. No, I, I take that back. I think there have been different points in my career where I've, I've had to mature that process to, you know, I used to live and die with every win and every loss, you know, a long time ago, somewhere in the middle of my career, I said, this is going to be awfully miserable if I try to live life like this. So to me, I'm not worried about anything really past today. We'll, we'll, we'll get tomorrow's practice mapped out at some point today. And then that's really as far as I'll allow my brain to go. I think the trickle down to the team then 
is that the guys know, hey, our focus is on winning our opening Friday night, then get ready for Saturday. But we're not going to take on the whole weekend right now. And so I think the compete factor, the intensity, the intangible, the take the extra base, dive to make a play, you know, put your body on the line to make a play, that's going to be the same. I think the difference is, okay, we've got guys that have modeled it for a year. And, you know, Keegan, an interesting point in a rebuild, and I think we've seen this with Lance's team, you know, you certainly see it. Bill, I don't think Bill's ever rebuilding, but you see his, <laughs> we just you see reload. Person. But you see, you see a guy like, you know, Dewan Harris now compared to what he was two years ago. He's always been really good, but now, you know, it's just a, a totally different player. You see Kevin McCullough a year ago, this elite defender, and now he's elite defender and also score. You see Johnny Furphy two months ago compared to who he is now. There's a development cycle that happens, and for us, we had guys last year in our lineup who frankly in a in a different life cycle they don't play because they they you know get out of the blocks and they struggle well we didn't have any other options so the the greatest example is michael brooks like michael brooks last year at one point in the year was in the tank like we're, we're a couple weekends in the big 12 play he is scuffling and you know he kind of gets through that scuffle and then has a huge second half hits a ton of home runs hits you know dang near close to 400 in the second half and ends up being, you know, a, a, a big time player. That development thing is, is sometimes a benefit of having, you know, zero depth because those guys really, really get to play through the, through the, you know, struggles mm -hmm. that changes when you have depth, because now there's just, you know, if you're struggling, someone else gets a shot. And if they go off, you gotta, you gotta keep working while you yeah. wait. So, I think the foundational pieces, I know I've really, really long answer, but the foundational pieces will never change. You and I will talk, Lord willing, in 10 years, and those things will be the same. How we do it, how we evolve, how guys handle that maturity. You know, how does Cody handle being being the guy versus a freshman that sneaks up on people? You know, that's, that, that's a question mark. You know, Jake English last year got to kind of ease into the season behind Cole Elvis and, and became a great player in the second half. You know, how does he handle all of a sudden – you know, man, this guy's got power and we have to be careful here. And then how do the new guys, you know, how does Ben Hartle jump in and, and play first base, catch DH, you know, jump in where I think those are all the question marks that, that we'll have every year. You mentioned a couple of names there. So let's talk a little bit about this year's ball club, especially for maybe some of the fans that aren't quite as in tune with, with the roster right now. You know, Cody, like you said in your press conference last week, you know, he's not going to surprise anybody this year. They've got a full year's worth of tape on them. He's going to see a little bit different pitching style. He's going to have a different type of game this year. Um, so he might not have the, the, the same wow factor that he had last year bursting onto the scene. But for the fans that aren't quite as familiar with your ball club or, or just need a little bit more insight on some of these guys, who are some of the names this year that you feel like this team's really going to lean on and that the fans should start paying attention to now early before the season gets going? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start with our young guys. We, we do have a couple freshmen who I really like. Dominic Vagley is going to pitch in our rotation. I'm not sure where, but he's he's clearly won a rotation job, and is a guy that I can see, you know, pitching at the front end of our of our thing for a while. He's he's really really good and and very mature for a for a freshman. He's from Columbia, Illinois, and a guy that Coach Scott found and a guy we really like. And then next to him is Ty Wisdom, and I've I've given you know Coach Price credit on this from from day one when when I got the job. I talked to Coach Price and. One of the first things he said was, you better get off the phone with me and call Ty Wisdom because that sucker can hit. He really can. He's been very impressive. He's playing second and first. I think he'll factor in DH and, and maybe a catcher down the line. Of course, everyone knows Cody. Uh, you know, some of the new guys in, the, in that junior class. Ethan Lanthier is a guy that we got out of St. Cloud State University, a, a, a Division II school you know, just grew a ton his first two years and went up to the Cape and was an all-star and, and wanted to take his talents to the power five. And we were fortunate to, to get him, you know, he's for, he grew up about 15 minutes from where I grew up. So there were all kinds of, you know, people that we knew in common and, and we were able to make a good run at him, but big, big right-handed power arm and a guy we're excited about. And then another Minnesota guy by way of Minnesota state, Mankato, Evan Shaw, a lefty who was at 
Mankato State and ended up down at Cochise Junior College, which Mankato, Minnesota and Douglas, Arizona are about as far up opposite places in the world as you can be. So he's, you know, he's, he's really worked hard to get here. And then another arm, Patrick Stites, big righty out of Peoria, Arizona, who went to Central Arizona College. We really like him. So a couple guys there that, you know, I think have a chance to be really, really good on, on the mound. Um, and then, you know, we've got uh, an interesting, we're old, you know, 16 seniors. That's a, that's a lot. Yeah. 16 seniors slash grad transfers slash redshirt seniors, whatever you want to call them. But, you know, Lenny Ashby kid that we got out of the university of New Mexico, he was an Odessa college kid, really, really good. And uh, really like him. Couple arms that we were able to get. Reese Dutton is a name that I think Jayhawk Nation is going to learn really fast. He won ten games last year at USC Upstate, and and will jump into our our rotation in some way. And you know Grant Adler, kind of in that that same mold. Which Toss State kid was the newcomer of the year in the American last year. So really like him. And then two bats that I want to highlight: John Nett, from a, another D two kid out of Saint Cloud State, who. You know, I had seen play him mul multiple times up in the Northwoods League, and you know he was such a uh, such a good player, and and was a Northwoods League All Star, and and again wanted to take a shot at the Power Five, and and you know very fortunate to get him. He's a really tough, gritty center fielder that gives us a lot of depth. And then Ben Hartle has been not a surprise to us because we knew that he was really, really good. I think the surprise has been that he's literally lived up to the expectations and then some. He is big time catch and throw behind the plate, really balances with English so we don't have to catch Jake every minute. But Ben's a really good athlete, can play first, can play second, can play third, can certainly DH and and is a big time catcher. So, uh, you know, and we've got more, but those would be the guys I think that, you know, off the top of my head really, really jump off the page. Go ahead. That was about half the roster, so that's yeah, got to no, be a good pro good problem to have when you can name no. off half the roster as giving you a lot of potential. Yeah, I think that's one thing. You know, I'm still getting familiar with myself with a lot of this team, but you do have a lot of versatility up and down this list. You know, between a lot of balance between lefty and righties, guys that can play multiple positions. It's probably going to be some fun competition this year for you guys as coaches to see who's going to step up who's going to develop at a quicker pace and who's going to, you know, just take that, that mantra on to be, to be the guy this year. As we look at the season as a whole, you know, first pitch coming up here in a couple of weeks, first homestand in about a month from now, um, what's kind of the message to the team this year as, as a group, you know, what are the expectations for the season as far as what would consider the season a success, but what are you guys and your staff telling the guys this year as, as the, the one or two things that they need to really focus on to continue developing this program? Yeah, you know, we spend a ton of time talking about just how we play the game. And and I think there's a simplicity to, uh, you know, I, I people talk about culture all the time. And, and you know, side note, I, I grew up in Edina, Minnesota and played for Hall of Fame high school hockey coach and in one of the most storied programs, maybe the most storied, well, I won't even say maybe, I'll just say the most storied high school hockey program probably in the country. And it was funny because we didn't have to talk a whole lot about winning. It was just such a part. It was just from the time you were a kid, you watched the Hornets and you just kind of knew that that's what you're supposed to do. And I think there's a, we've got a little bit of, of that feel going on of, the guys know what we're about and they, they know that above anything, being a great teammate, being an unbelievable competitor and being a real pro about what you do is valued at a super high level. So I think the, the kind of the day-to-day -day foundational goal of, no, I, I have to be a pro today, which means I need to get up. I need to shower. I need to eat breakfast. I need to be a class on time. And then I need to get to practice, get my body ready to go so that when, when it's my turn to go, I'm ready to perform because I'm competing for a job. You know, we've, we've really ingrained that. And then the style of play of, you know, we run around third, less than two outs. We talk about, Hey, make your free throw. It's just, you just hit a 350 hop ground ball to the shortstop at 12 miles an hour. If you want, I don't care, but that run's got to score. Yeah. And then, you know, 
likewise, you know, you hit a double, that's like returning the kickoff past the 50. You know, you're 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 a couple plays away from being in the red zone. So for us, it's like, okay, well, you got to get the first down, you got to move them to third. Mm. Uh, you know, pitchers, you got to win the first three pitches at a really, really high level. Like we've got to, we have got to be one and two way more than we're two and one. And offensively, we've got to be a lot more two and one than we are one and two. So I think we do a really good job of preparing the guys mentally in terms of, hey, your focus here is not like, and I, I've said this to him a bunch, mediocre players dream about having a great season. Good players you know, dream about having a good game. Elite next level competitive winners are only consumed with the next pitch. And mm-hmm. so I am the worst in the world at the get up and, okay, guys, our goal is our first championship is the Big 12. And then the second one is the, you know, conference tournament. And then it's the regional. And then it's the super. So we've got this many ch- chances at rings. Like, I can't I can't get ahead like that. My brain doesn't work that way. It's very much, um, you know, in the day. So, but I think there's an unspoken. And then a couple times a year I tell them, hey, okay, let's, let's, let's fast forward way ahead here and talk mm-hmm. about what an Omaha team really looks like because people throw out Omaha all the time. But if you look at the teams that are there, well, what do they do? Well, they don't walk anyone. They, they don't strike out. They don't kick the ball around. They play really good situational baseball and the bullpen oftentimes is the, the starting pitching is explosive and most teams want the starting pitching to stay in because once you get to the back end, it's just, it's firepower. So, yeah. you know, we talk about, okay, if, if we really want to be in that conversation, then this is, this is what those teams look like. But then, you know, I try to get them way off of that and say, okay, that's, that's not even on our radar. Like we've got to play Illinois, Chicago in, in 10 days. Uh, and trust me, those guys are not going to be scared. Like those guys are, are ready, well coached, preparing and trying to do the same thing we are. So, you know, Terrible answer, boring, didn't give any good sound bites on, on Omaha or whatever. But I, I really think that's it's the only way to, to function through a season without going nuts. The word that kept popping into my mind as you were going through that was discipline. Yes. Um, I think it's always you can see a, a great team, a great program, a great individual player. They all have that sense of strong discipline. And as we're starting to kind of wrap up here, um, I want to think about, you know, the KU athletic program as a whole, since Travis Goff has been here, we've had a lot of new hires across all of athletics. The thing I've seen, I guess several things I've seen across athletics the last few years is this strong sense of discipline that this culture we're building here on campus and here down in Lawrence, Kansas is we're going to be a disciplined team. That's not going to beat ourselves. We're going to make game winning plays. We're going to develop. We're going to do what you're talking about. We're going to learn how to eat healthy, how to take care of our bodies, how to develop our bodies, we're going to show up to class on time. We're going to be responsible. And when it comes time for game time, we're going to play like we practice, which is discipline. So I think that's the word that just kept popping up in my head as you were talking about that is, is it all starts with discipline and discipline and consistency. If you can start doing that, then all these other things can start added in. Um, but I want to talk about, you know, you and Travis Goff for a moment. As we go back to your, your introductory press conference, you kind of talked a lot about how it was an easy no-brainer decision for you as soon as that, that call was made. Uh, just kind of tell us from your perspective, working alongside Travis Goff and his administration, you know, KU, I think, is in a very unique position as an athletic program across the entire country with his leadership. But just talk a little bit about that relationship you have with him, how, how significant it is to the, the growth of what you guys are doing, but how that relationship as a whole with KU athletics is, is putting all of KU in a better position moving forward. Yeah, it, I don't – we don't have enough time for me to talk about Travis Goff. I mean, there, there is no bigger fan in the world. And I, I knew Kansas was a sleeping giant, but it's still, you know, a sleeping giant with the wrong leadership is not a sleeping giant. So part of a massive, massive piece of what drew me here was Travis and to put a percent on it, I don't know, but it, it, it was extremely high. Because I think his vision, who he is as a person, what he values, the consistency, the authenticity, whatever anyone thinks of Travis out there in terms of how awesome he is, I, I, I promise he's even better than that. It is a, it's an unrelenting support of 
doing it the right way and building it the right way, not taking shortcuts and, and really doing it in a way that's sustainable and ultimately in the best interest of the student athlete. And it's very, very sincere. And you, you watch him as a family man, how he interacts with his family, the type of dad he is, the type of husband he is like th there's, there's a reason that our athletic department is as aligned as it is. And it's because of, you know, his leadership. And then I think, you know, all the other people that he's surrounded himself with are incredible too. So, you know, Sean Lester, my sport administrator, same thing, unbelievable in all those, in all those areas, checks all those boxes, you know, has a incredible attitude of working together and how do we drive this forward? So we have an incredible athletic department filled with people who at the end of the day, truly have the student athletes best interest in mind. And then, are not afraid to be really aggressive and drive the thing forward. Uh, you know, in, in compliance, I'll use compliance as an example. Our compliance department is amazing. When you go and talk to compliance and, and say, hey, we, we're trying to do this, it's very much an open conversation of, you know, instead of a going in and having a conversation or, or academics, same thing. Like, it, we're not starting where it's okay, it's us versus compliance, it's us versus academics, it's us versus this, it's it's all together. Like, how can, as the head baseball coach here, how can I support our academic endeavors to make these guys the greatest, greatest student ever? Um, how as the head baseball coach, can I run a program compliant with the NCAA rules where we're all trying to, to push the needle forward? How can I come alongside our, our mental health people and, and as a head baseball coach, support them and what they're doing because ultimately they're they're really behind what we're trying to do so but again none of that happens without travis modeling it and you can't be around the guy for more than a minute or two and, and see that you know he he is as big a jayhawk as you could possibly ever be so yeah he's he's the real deal he's a massive massive well he's literally the reason i'm here because he hired me but in terms of my you know me wanting to be here you know, I, I, I could, I don't know what number I'd put on, but it's a massively high percentage of, of why I want to, why I want to come here. Yep. hundred percent agree with that. I think his leadership is very reflective across the entire athletic department, not just in the coaches he hires, but even within those individual teams programs, everyone is modeling that same type of leadership style. I think that's, that's huge moving forward. But last thing I wanted to kind of end you with here, um, Obviously, baseball is not the the primary sport here at KU. We we know that it's it's got to compete with football and basketball. But as we look to de develop a, a strong fan base and continue to grow that fan base and support, what is kind of the message you have to the fan base this year for those that haven't bought in yet, to those that haven't come and checked you guys out at the ballpark? What is the message to the fan base to get them more involved this year to support you guys, and what can they expect on the on the other end from you guys if they start showing your support? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, I look at it, Keegan, is we we win, we'll take care of that. We, we need to put together a product that people want to come and watch. I mean, I haven't met too many people that don't like going to a baseball game. I remember a uh, long, long time ago coaching the Northwoods League. I got kicked out of a game and went up, you know, into the crowd. I went and showered and got dressed and, and went out. And I walked around and – uh I realized that, you know, there are probably 2000 people that are not watching the game, but they're a part of a social, mm -hmm. you know, it was a social time. It was, they were out on the party deck. They were, you know, a group of people here, some kids on the playground, like, like baseball truly is America's pastime. And it's hard to find someone that doesn't like going to a game. And so we need to do our piece and win. And I think when people do come out, I think they'll, they'll, they'll see a couple things. One, how we play, is really fun to watch. Like mm. these guys play hard. They're aggressive. They're tough. They're gritty. We do all the things that people like watching in sports. You know, you can't hit someone in, in, uh, in baseball, but you know, we, we do the equivalent, man. We get hit by pitches. We slide hard. We, you know, dive into walls, you know, yesterday in a scrimmage, Mike Kazuski climbed over a wall and made a catch. Like it's an exciting brand of baseball. Uh, and then two, our, <laughs> our marketing people, our game day people. I mean, this is a, incredibly fun environment and there's stuff for everyone. If, 
if uh, someone wants to come and sit in a quiet corner of the stadium and, and, and keep score and be really focused and listen to Brian Hades broadcast on the radio, they can do that. If someone wants to bring their five kids and have them jump into Bout's house for two hours and hammer hot dogs and popcorn, they can do that too. And if a couple of the fraternities want to show up and, you know, have pizza delivered to the ballpark and, and go crazy, they can do that. So I, I think, when people come out, I think they'll enjoy it, but we need to win. And then we need, we need the type of weather we have today and we'll have no yeah. problem throwing this thing out. Yeah. If it stays like this, it'll certainly feel like baseball, even though it's still early February. No yeah. Doubt. First home stands coming up March 1st. Uh, obviously it's still about a month away for the fans to see you guys up close here at home, but first pitch for you guys, February 16th, coming up down in Texas against the university of Illinois, Chicago, but coach Fitzgerald really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Uh, I look forward to hopefully doing some more of these, I know there's so many baseball topics we didn't even get to, to touch today. Would love to get your thoughts later on the NIL, how that's affecting recruiting, talk about analytics and just how things have changed over the over your time coaching, get into the development side and all that. But we do really appreciate uh, you taking the time to join me today on the podcast. And I hope uh, Jayhawk fans, those of you that catch this later, go out and support them. That first home stand's coming up in a month. Uh, there's a Missouri game in there, so a very, very big rivalry type game. I know. You have seen Missouri in your time in, in at LSU and SEC. But fans, go go support the team this year. There, there's a lot of exciting things going on in KU athletics, not just in football and basketball. I think we've seen over this last year that the athletic programs have done a great job of getting the fans involved, and uh, everyone's been enjoying their time. So, Coach, again, appreciate you taking the time to join me today, and I hope we can do this again soon. Egan, anytime, man. Would love to do it again. And that was my conversation with head baseball coach Dan Fitzgerald of the Kansas baseball team. Super grateful he took the time to jump on with me, and I hope we can do some more of this throughout the season. Would love to help bring some more awareness and support to the K baseball program to the less of KU Jayhawk Nation. So thank you guys for checking that out. I hope you guys really enjoyed it, and I hope you guys go out and show your support this year. They've got their first pitch coming up here February 16th down in Texas, and then the first home stand the weekend of March 1st and the 2nd at home here up in Lawrence, Kansas. Friday, 3 o'clock is first pitch for that home slate. Hope you guys go out there and show you show them your support from day one. Would we'll love to continue building the, the fan base for this program and hope it becomes a, another big staple of the athletic program here moving forward. Because Dan and his, his coaching staff are great. There's a lot of fun players on this team, a lot of exciting things to go check out for K Baseball. So make sure you do your job and support them this year. Hope to, we can see you guys out there uh, first pitch on opening day. Well, that's going to wrap things up for this episode. Again, if you haven't done so yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button here on YouTube because we've got tons of great stuff coming along the way. It is Super Bowl week, and we got plenty of Chiefs content coming this week. We're going to have a leg an episode talking about the legacy of Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, anybody else on this team, assuming we win this weekend. Of course, we'll have our official game preview and predictions later on this week. Um, CJ and I will also kick out a Super Bowl betting episode just kind of give you some of our thoughts on how to bet the super bowl uh, so a lot of great stuff still plenty of ku content football basketball we got royals baseball stuff coming up here soon with their spring training getting underway so a lot happening and you guys don't want to miss any of it so go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you're watching here on youtube help us get to 500 here over the next month or so, we are well on our way. If you hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at KCSA Pod, we'd love to get some of your takes on the show. Let us know any of your thoughts, ideas you have about any of the teams we cover. We'd love to interact with you guys more and more. And of course, if you're listening on Spotify, you can like and subscribe to the podcast there as well. Give us a five star review, share it with your friends. So appreciate you guys taking the time to check this one out. And as always, rock chalk, go Jayhawks, go Chiefs, all of it. Super Bowl weekend, baby. Let's go get a big dub this weekend. See you later.